Chess is kind of one of these classic problems in computer science for, for a couple of different reasons. One being that it was always thought of as a test of intelligence in a multifaceted way, where you need kind of logical, mathematical intuition, but you also need creativity, you need strategies, and it's also quite taxing mentally. So it's thought of as kind of the mental decathlon, so to speak. There's a new America in the making. An America that has taught amazing new machines how to do man's bidding, to bring man's future closer. This is something that they've been talking about really since the advent of computers. It's almost as if they build a computer and they, then they say, can we build one good enough to be really good at chess? Because chess for thousands of years has been you know, something that we've used to measure intelligence. And if a computer could defeat a human who really knows what he or she is doing at the chessboard, then, you know, we're talking about 2001, a space odyssey. Then they can do anything. It's always been thought of if we could get a computer to play at an extremely high level, we could solve important problems uh, of more worldly concern. Every day, another electronic computer created by IBM goes to work in industry, science, government, or defense. IBM computers solve in minutes problems that once took weeks, months, even years. This was, for IBM, a very important exercise. And IBM, even by the late, the late 1990s, was not what it had been. It was not the giant, the 600-pound gorilla of the world of computing. It had been overtaken in some respects. This was a chance for it to reassert its position, its primacy in the world of supercomputing. So the stakes are high. In one corner, the world's greatest chess player, 34-year-old Gary Kasparov. In the other, the world's greatest chess playing computer, a machine called Deep Blue. Gary Kasparov was the greatest player ever at this point in time. This was the most dominant player of his generation. He had been world champion already for 12 years. He was the highest ranked player in history. He'd been all but invincible for a very long time. When he walked into a tournament, people thought about being in second place, not about first place. They just knew it was a foregone conclusion. This guy was just gonna smash everybody else. It was thought originally that to beat a human being, a computer would have to think more like a human being. But computers have relied essentially on the brute force approach calculating as much as possible in the allotted time. It's a tremendous test for a computer because the number of possible chess positions that you could get if you took all different, every possible combination of moves from the beginning of the game, they said it's the numbers like uh, the number of atoms in the universe, you know, some inconceivable number. Kasparov played two matches with Deep Blue. The first one was in 1996. And that was won handily by Kasparov. But there was something very noteworthy about that match. In the very first game, the computer defeated Kasparov. That win in the first game was historic. World champion had never lost a slow game, full-time control game against a computer. And that was definitely something to build on. We felt that if we had a lot of time to work on the program, then uh, we could get it much stronger and we would have a good chance in the second match. The high-stakes world of competitive chess is bracing for a rematch of the century. It pits Russian grandmaster Garry Kasparov against a very smart computer. The Deep Blue team went underground, working overtime to create a smarter, faster machine they say is now unbeatable. A year later, we come to the major match, the one in 1997 held here in New York. It was a six-game match, just like the first contest. It was incredible how much the media followed the second match. It was a circus. In a new media landscape, really, at the beginning of the internet, people were following this all over the world. People who had no interest in chess. People who only had interest in this narrative of man versus machine. It's much stronger, it's faster, and it knows more about chess than any other chess program. This time, it's no longer fun, no longer science. I think they want to win. But IBM had really ramped up their PR machine to make sure that everybody knew that they had a winner. IBM, before the match, was bragging that Deep Blue could evaluate 200 million moves per second. 
Bruce is only three for, for Kasparov. If you think about it that way, it's quite remarkable that Kasparov was more or less the equal of Deep Blue at that time. It's, it's much greater pressure than in, in a normal game because I have to be more cautious. I have to take less risk. I should understand that any risky decision could have gravest consequences for me. Gary Kasparov, like most great chess players, has a certain amount of self-confidence. When people have been telling you you're the smartest guy in the world since you were about nine or 10 years old, it's hard not to believe it. He definitely has a healthy ego. And that is, is generally something that is a positive factor for our champions. It's better to be uh, too confident than not confident enough. I always had a very simple principle, losing is not an option. I was one of the commentators for the match. Now he's finally made a move. He's gotten out of the pen. Right from the get-go, Kasparov showed why he's Gary Kasparov, why he's such a dominant player. Because Kasparov won again, as usual, and we all expected that he would just show that no computer was going to beat a human at the most human of games. But something interesting happened. Near the end of the game, the 44th move, the computer played a strange move. And it's a move, if you see the chessboard, it doesn't really make any sense at all. It moved its rook from d5 to d1. I'm not a, a great chess player myself, or even a good one, but even I can tell that this move was very pointless, accomplished nothing offensively or defensively. And Kasparov was not sure what that meant. And so he kept thinking and thinking, and he kind of deduced, incorrectly it turned out, that, well, I'm, I'm Gary Kasparov, and on my best day, I can supposedly think 15 moves ahead. And I don't get why Deep Blue made this play. So he inferred that Deep Blue therefore could think beyond him. It could look 16 or 17, etc., 20 moves ahead instead. Later on, we learned uh, from Murray Campbell and the other programmers involved, that was simply a computer bug. It was a mistake. People forget that things go wrong with machines, especially one with, that's so complicated. And there was just some kind of bug. And we, we saw the move, we said, oh, OK, that's something we have to fix. Deep Blue hit a glitch in its code, and they had a failsafe in the code where if you're in an endless loop, because you're on a clock in chess, if you don't make some play, you eventually would forfeit. And so after X seconds, it would make a random legal move instead. And that's what it did. It made a random legal move. That's actually probably one of the worst moves you could make in that position. And Kasparov instead mistook this bug as a, as a feature, as a sign of deep genius he thought this random play was. People would actually resign, finally, a move later but Kasparov was disturbed that he couldn't understand why Deep Blue made this play. It was so bad that he thought it was good instead. And that perhaps led him to think throughout the match that something funny was going on. And I think it definitely impacted his play. We should mention that along with, with uh, Gary Kasparov, the Deep Blue team uh, is with us on stage. He won quite handily, and he had reason to be proud and confident. I wanted to see another game. I wanted to see Kasparov play black and what kind of strategy he was going to use. The second game of the match was an absolute positional masterpiece. Immediately, there was this sense that this is going to be very hard fought. The computers have caught up not aggressive and tactical that you would expect a computer calculating lots of moves, but rather much more slow-paced, strategic, even thoughtful. Kasparo has always a lot of body language. He's a very emotional player. He does not have what you call a poker face. One thing we love to talk about whenever Kasparov is playing is the number of faces he pulls. Now that can often intimidate a player when you see this energy coming at you. Well, that had no effect against Deep Blue. It was irrelevant. I think it showed strain and a troubled nature, the way he was reacting at the board. He wasn't a happy camper. Kasparov is not somebody that wants to sit in the lost position with millions of people watching. So he resigned on the early end of it. By the next day, it was discovered that if Kasparov had continued playing and played basically a perfect series of moves, he had to draw. He kind of resigned 
fairly early thinking, well, Deep Blue can think beyond me, so what's the point of playing this out? It's inevitable. When in fact, he may well have been able to have a draw instead of taking a loss. And that kind of chagrined him. Was he facing a new development in computer thinking? Was there human intervention involved? That's when all hell broke loose. Kasparov suspected that maybe all wasn't right with the machine and that maybe there was an invisible hand. What's, what's your take now on this new deeper blue? Is it, is it deeper? I think something to that blue will happen. He was saying that something completely different played this game than the other one. It seemed a provocative statement. And, well, Maurice actually decided to stir the pot by drawing it at him. If I'm reading you correctly, Kaspar, or maybe I'm speaking out of turn, do you think there may be some kind of uh, human intervention on the part of this game? Or no, we is don't. there a suggestion of the possibility? It reminds me of the famous goal of Maradona scored against him in 86. You know, he said it was a hand of God. <laughs> I'm not a huge soccer fan, but I, I understood what that meant. The, the big game where Maradona knocked in the goal with his hand, and he referred to it as the hand of God. Soccer fans consider touching the ball with your hand as cheating. So it was quite clear what he was saying. For the world's greatest player, the ambassador of our sport, and that was a serious accusation, and that changed the entire complexion of the match now that he was actually sounding out IBM as cheaters. His view is that Deep Blue is clearly a very talented program, but, but every now and then in a challenging position, you have some human beings who are, who are overriding its plans. And I didn't like it one bit. I thought it was disgraceful that in this competition that he would jump to, to a conclusion like that without any evidence whatsoever, and that he would spoil the atmosphere completely by saying that. And I grabbed the microphone and I said, maybe he should, he should come to grips with the fact that Deep Blue can do a lot of things that he did not think were possible. I, I think, you know, I think this, is not, this is not a very fair statement. Because I, I couldn't understand better than anybody else between, between Deep Blue and any other computer. We were just shocked. I was stunned by it. It really left a sour taste in all our mouths, you know, because we just felt like he should have just accepted it take it on the chin and come back. You're Gary Kasparov, after all. Well, uh, I think we'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you, Gary Kasparov. Games three, four, and five all ended in draws, with Kasparov pressing in four and five, but just not being able to pull them off. He did not play like Kasparov. He didn't play with his usual aggression and fierceness. He was playing as an underdog, basically, instead of as a favorite, which he probably still was at that time, and erased a lot of his own, I think, natural advantages. Kasparov is also dealing with all the emotional consequences and all the psychological consequences. The machine doesn't have to worry about that. The machine's got a fan running that cools it down. He also realized that he was beatable, that this was not a joke. He could lose. And I think he lost some of his mojo and started playing a lot less accurately, a lot less aggressively, as would be typical for Kasparov. And that really set him up for disaster. I think he may have made a mistake by trying to kind of basically hack the computer and say, we're going to try and find things where its programs aren't strong. This is kind of a case where Kasparov's human instincts got in the way of his clear human thinking. Shakespeare had it, you know, to thine own self be true. Well, he wasn't true to himself. The fact that he let it get to him in his head meant to a certain extent that the computer already had him beat. As far as playing the last game, it was just awful in one moment. I mean, he played into a trap that was a famous trap that Gary Kasparov should never, ever fall into. Kasparov had been tricked and outwitted into a terrible position. And that did compel him to resign. And he had lost the match. And whoa! Oh. Deep blue Kasparov. When it happened, we were stunned. And that was the first time ever a computer program had literally crushed a world champion. Of course, at that point, many people felt, well, computers had outdone the human mind. I think it was Kasparov outdoing himself. He still felt he was the stronger player. He just didn't play well. 
The winner and new chess champion of the world is a black box known as Deep Blue. This is a huge boon for IBM. It's pulled off the great feat in supercomputing. A human being outthought by one of its machines. In 1996, uh, after the first match, it was Kasparov who suggested having a second match, which IBM agreed to. After this second match, Kasparov won the rematch, and IBM didn't grant it. Why would it want to risk losing the very tangible profits it's made when its stock goes up after the victory by playing again? He didn't get a chance to avenge this loss. There's no reason for them to play again. They had won. They had demonstrated everything they wanted to do. They basically dismantled it afterward. I think it was in the Smithsonian for a while. I guess that, that was kind of the Sandy Koufax of, <laughs> of computer programs. You retire when, when you just won something. What people may not realize today is that there is no more man versus machine because it's not a fair fight anymore. The machines are infinitely stronger than, than the human players. Kasparov was trying to uphold humanity in, in one sense. I'm not sure humanity needed upholding. I mean, human beings programmed Deep Blue. It's still a human uh, representation of human intelligence. We thought of it as man the toolmaker against man the artist. The artist is very important, but, but so is the scientist, so is the toolmaker. And we need to develop both these things.